Hi, folks. I see we've got about 30 people joining us on the call now. And uh, this is Leah speaking from the Atheist Radio, Radio Project. Project. We're, We're just, just going to get started in about one more minute. We're, We're just, just going to wait for a few more people to join the call, and then we'll get started with our webinar tonight, How to Find a Viable Low-Power Radio Transmission Site. Um, and we have some folks, other folks from Prometheus joining us tonight to uh, talk to us about this very important topic when it comes to starting a radio station. So we're just waiting a few more minutes for some other people to join the call, and then we'll get started. Thanks for your patience. All right, good evening, everyone. This is Leah Gerardo, the Education and Training Coordinator for the Prometheus Radio Project. I want to thank you all again for joining us tonight. Uh, we have a bunch of people on the call, and we're ready to get started here. So I, um, I just want to let folks know that if you're accessing the training by phone, you can also watch the presentation. So we have some slides prepared for you tonight. And you can do that by going to anymeeting.com slash Radio Prometheus 1, and that's Radio Prometheus with the number 1, uh, and just sign into the meeting that way. And that also lets you access the chat box, which is how we're going to be fielding questions for the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, so thanks again for joining us tonight. Um, so we're going to have an excellent presentation by our, some folks from our technical department to talk about um, specifically about finding a suitable transmission site for your new low-power FM radio station. And um, this is part of an ongoing series uh, that's happening, and there's a whole bunch of them that will be leading up to the application window this fall. And I just wanted to let folks know about those upcoming webinars so that if there's other topics that you're interested in knowing about as you apply for a radio station and once you get started with your station, um, you'll have some information, tools, and resources to do that. Um, the next one we have coming up is the How to Apply for an FCC Community Radio License. That's happening next Wednesday. It's a week from today at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, the presenters, presenters for that are going, going to be uh, our own Ian Smith and Sunshine Jolly, Jolly uh, from, from the, the Prometheus, Prometheus Radio Project. Radio Project. Uh, following that on Thursday, September 5th, that's at 6 p.m., we'll have a meeting on what particip a participatory radio station looks like, looking at creating democratic governance structures. And then another one that is upcoming is on Wednesday, September 11th. That's at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and that is Share the Air, How to Find and Distribute Radio Programming. And we'll have Andrew Stelzer and Andalusia Noel joining us for that one. Uh, so just keep an eye on our webinars. Uh, on the website, that's prometheusradio.org slash webinars, because we'll also be having upcoming trainings on grassroots fundraising, the nuts and bolts of programming, how to build a volunteer news department, and free software programs for helping you run a station. So keep an eye out for that. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of an intro about the Prometheus Radio Project for folks who might not be uh, completely familiar with our history and what we're up to over here. Um, Prometheus is a not-for-profit based in Philadelphia. 
and we've been around for about 15 years doing work to build participatory radio as a voice for community expression and a tool for social justice organizing. We exist to counter corporate consolidation and control of the media. Over time, the media has become less and less accessible to communities as corporations have acquired, acquired a bigger, bigger share of it. it. And what, what we need right, right now is to own our own media outlets. We need to tell our own stories and to combat stereotypes and speak truth to power in order to create positive changes in our communities. For the past 13 years, Prometheus has helped hundreds of communities all over the nation start their own radio stations. And today there are over 800 low power FM radio stations on air. And as we know, this fall, new opportunities for low power radio stations um, are gonna be opening up, uh, especially in urban areas where um, what, it mean, what this means for low power FM is that there's a greater broadcast range, and we're gonna get into that a little bit later tonight. So it's a particularly exciting in urban areas where a low power station can reach hundreds of thousands of listeners and have a massive impact. Um, so by community radio, what we mean here at Prometheus is uh, transformative for both listeners and media makers, participatory, which means democratically organized stations with community involvement in the production of content, and affordable and accessible stations with multimedia capabilities that are locally rooted. Um, we here at Prometheus are on the ground in communities across the country working with grassroots groups much like the ones that many of you here tonight are a part of, and we want to use the media to create a more democratic society. Um, this training uh, is a part of webinars that are part of our strategy to promote participatory radio as a part of building that society. And I just wanted to encourage you to please consider supporting Prometheus, knowing that your financial support today means a better media future. Um, tonight, we have Anna Martina and Will Floyd joining us from the tech department at Prometheus, and they're gonna give us uh, details about how to find a viable transmission site, and I'm just going to send it over to Anna to give us a little intro about the tech department and what we're going to be looking at this evening. Hi, everybody. Good night. Um, my name is Anna Martina, and I'm part of the technical team in Prometheus. And we've been uh, providing technical support for applicants. And we're going to be going today over um, what do you need to know in order to choose the transmitter site. And well, basically in the technical team, it's me and Will, who's gonna be uh, leading this uh, webinar tonight. And Paul Bain, who developed our free software, which is a software that will help you to find out whether there's a, an available frequency in your community. And Will is gonna be doing a little demonstration uh, at the end of this webinar for those folks who are not familiar in the use of R3. Um, so yeah, so welcome everybody, and um, I'm just gonna pass it to Will so he can introduce the um, the agenda for tonight. Hi everybody, um, this is Will Floyd, um, and so you can get an idea of uh, the general um, outline for tonight's webinar. Uh, we're gonna cover. Um, mostly uh, focus on finding a transmitter site. We'll also touch on some uh, FCC rules and issues regarding the actual uh, location, property, renting, um, and towers uh, for your site. Um, and then we'll end with a demonstration of, uh, on R3 of how um, you can use that software to help find a viable transmission site. Um, so we should get started, I guess, now. And um, Ana Martina is going to start off and give us some basics about um, what a transmission site is and what um, what it looks like. Thanks, Paul. Um, well, let's start with uh, what is a transmission site. So for those who are um, attending the webinar, some of you might be familiar with what we call a transmission site. Um, transmission site is also called tower site or antenna site of um, the, the basically the place where you're going to be putting your transmitter and antenna. Um, so sometimes this place can be shared with the place where you have your studio, and that's an ideal situation. 
because then you just have to run um, a cable from your student. You don't have to do um, a lot of complicated uh, stuff. But in some cases, you're going to probably have to find a transmitter site in a different place, uh, different from your studio location, and we're going to explain what that will, um, you know, what are you going to need to do in order to uh, send your signal from the studio to the transmitter site. But uh, in terms of what goes in the transmission site, um, it's uh, basically the place where you're going to be uh, putting your transmitter, and your transmitter is going to be running uh, a from um, um, it's going to be running to the antenna um, with a cable, with a coaxial cable, and this place is the place from where you're going to be actually sending your airwaves to your listeners. So from this place is is the center of your transmission, um, and what it goes in this place, it is a transmission audio processor. And this place, it needs to be a place that is enclosure because um, you wanted to have some way to control uh, the, the climate control because um, these equipments can get really hot because they're running in a high power. In this case, they're going to be running with 100 watts. Um, so you need also power, of course, to um, you know, um, be running your transmitter. And then finally, you're going to have your antenna, which is uh, where you are going to be um, sending the airwaves, and um, again, this place, the transmission site, it doesn't need to be the same place where you're having your studio. Your studio is more a place where you want to have, um, you know, a place where it's open to the public and where people can go and produce radio shows, and there is a place where it's more visible. The transmission site is more the place where you're going to have a certain your equipment, and the thing is going to be running from there. So this place needs to be available for the engineer who's going to be working with you, but it doesn't need necessary to be accessible to people. And we're going to be talking actually over this webinar about what do you need to take in consideration to choose this, this transmission site because um, there are some um, zoning and rules that are actually going to help you to determine what is the best ideal place uh, of your transmission site. Um, but we're going to be talking about that in a little bit, but I'm going to just pass it to Will so he can talk a little bit about antennas, which is, um, again, from where you're going to be actually sending your, um, your signal to your listeners. All right. So um, just before I go to that slide, um, see on the uh, right of this current slide uh, uh, an enclosure that's housing um, a transmitter. Um, and on the next slide, um, the picture on the left is the antenna that is connected to that transmitter in the uh, enclosure. Um, so those are the kind of two main parts of your um, transmission, transmission site, site uh, like equipment. equipment. Um, um, you're going to need your transmitter, transmitter and, 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 and some, some sort of closet, closet or, or enclosure, enclosure or, or uh, uh, Tupperware, Tupperware bin, bin or something, or something. Um, to, to put, put the, the transmitter box in to keep it away from, uh, you know, snow, ice, rain, sleet, all that kind of stuff, um, because it needs to, um, you know, be safe and and uh, needs to run um, electricity. Um, and uh, Paul also, Paul Bain says squirrels because apparently um, squirrels are quite a problem for. Um, Trans transmitters, um, they're attracted to them, I hear. Um, yes, so um, once you connect, um, once you have a safe place to put your transmitter box, um, you, uh, and it's plugged in and you're um, running audio through it, you need to connect it to your antenna. And your antenna can go in, um, in different places. Um, you'll see on the right here, it's, uh, there are actually two antennas of two different low power stations, maybe one's a translator, but um, you'll see them circled. Um, and those are antennas that are connected to um, a transmitter box that's located in the, um, in the building behind the, uh, the tower there with the two antennas. Um, and of course, then on the left, also there's a, this, um, antenna setup is is on top of a, a roof 
um, and it's, it's weighed down. There's a little bit of a tower there, and it's weighed down by concrete blocks, and you can see that um, around the base of the tower. So um, there, there are different uh, creative uh, places that you can, you can try to put antennas, um, and uh, you'll need to consult an engineer often uh, in most cases to make sure that um, that's uh, legal and, and viable. Uh, and we'll go into that a little bit. And also, there's some some rules around uh, zoning and some other things that you'll have to uh, consider. Um, so, and you'll uh, on the next slide here, um, you'll see also you can you can um, add an antenna to existing structures. Uh, you'll see on the right the picture there is of two water towers. Um, and uh, you can see some little people up there. They're actually uh, putting a low-power FM antenna on top of the water tower. Um, you can also see on that same water tower uh, that there are cell phone um, antennas around the, the edge of it. Um, so um, you, if, if you start looking for um, an antenna location in your area, you, you'll probably start seeing all of the different kinds of uh, satellite dishes and TV antennas and cell phone antennas, um, all in different places. Um, and those are some good starting points um, to inquire about um, maybe if you could put a, a low-power FM uh, antenna at that location. Um, all right, so um, we talked a little bit about putting your uh, your antenna and transmitter um, in a different location um, than your main studio. And Ana Martina is going to talk about um, how that works. Okay, so that's what we call the STL, which is the Studio to Transmitter link. And that is, again, in case of a, if your studio is in a different location than your transmitter site, then you're going to have to send your signal from the studio to the place, to the location where you have your transmitter and your antenna. And there are different systems that you can use uh, to send your signal. You can do it through the internet, um, yeah, streaming. You can use um, Wi-Fi and uh, for larger um, signals uh, for power, some people would use and this, this similar is like the Wi-Fi, but it's a actually in a, in a higher uh, frequency, which is a microwave. Uh, but in this case, um, as you know, the low power FM radio stations are going to be running with 100 watts. And with that, we're going to have a coverage, an estimate coverage of um, probably up to 10 miles, depending on the terrain. Um, so again, uh, if you're going to be using an STL, um, a studio to transmit a link, you probably wanted to keep that in mind that um, you're probably not going to be able to use one of these systems that's going to be, you know, uh, further than um, five miles or something. You know, you're probably going to want to be actually closer uh, to your studio than that. Um, so basically what the STL is doing is it's just grabbing this signal from your studio and sending it um, from the device uh, to another device that is talking, um, they're, they're, both of them are talking to each other, and they're going to be, one is going to be on the roof from your, the place where you have your studio, so you're going to have to have a little antenna there. And then in the other end, where you have the antenna um, of your FM antenna, there's going to be another device that is going to be receiving the signal from the studio, and these ones are going to be connected, and then the signal is going to be uh, sent to the transmitter, and then finally to the antenna, which is going to be sending the the, uh, the signal through the airwaves. So these systems, um, sometimes depending on the equipment that you're using, um, and um, depending on um, and in the, in the distance also, um, they can be, you know, they can be expensive or they can be affordable, depending, again, on the equipment that you're using. Uh, but I hear from a, from a good friend uh, who is actually selling this kind of system that some cases you can use, um, build an STL for over $1,000, which is pretty affordable. Um, so, again, if when you are looking for transmitter side, you're finding trouble in figure out how to put your antenna in that studio location that you found. 
Look for other buildings. There are tall structures where you can actually be putting your antenna because that can be an option using an ASTL. So this is, you know, about to be, you know, creative and finding other places. Um, but one important thing to know here is the a, a studio to transmitter link. It also works uh, um, for line of sight. So again, as I was mentioning, this uh, there's going to be a device in on top of the roof of the studio that's going to be sending the signal, and it needs to be able to see the other device the, where you're going to have your antenna. So it needs to be a line of sight. These two devices need to be able to see each other because they're going to be communicating. So it is really important that when you're choosing this uh, the studio and the transmitter site. So these places from the roof, you need to be able to see, um, you know, so try to find a place where there's not going to be a physical object that is going to be in the middle that can be causing some uh, obstruction or possible interference between these communications. So that's really important that you know that when you're looking for um, your studio and your transmitter site. Um, but again, this can be an option that you can explore if uh, you're having trouble in finding um, a way to put your antenna, or if uh, the place where you choose to build your studio is not giving you a good coverage of the community where you're going to be serving, then you probably want to be looking for a place where you can be putting your antenna. Um, so yeah, this is about to be creative and, and again, you know, thinking in places where we can actually um, be having an optimal coverage. So talking about coverage. I'm going to talk a little bit about coverage area, um, which is a really key uh, uh, thing to talk about um, tower side. So how are you going to choose, um, how you can start looking for tower sites? Um, we're asking applicants um, to try to create maps uh, where they can define uh, areas that they want to be serving. So you can do this. Um, there are different tools you can use uh, Google to create a, a map and then handle this map to an engineer where you are, um, you know, uh, drawing the areas that you want to be serving. Uh, or you can just do this, you know, manually just drawing over a map. This is very important again because we're mentioning that these low power FM radio stations are going to be broadcasting at 100 watts. And with just uh, 100 watts, um, there's going to be unlimited coverage. Uh, depending on the terrain. Um, so when we're looking for transmitter sites, we want to be looking for a place that is close to those areas that you want to be serving, of course. Um, so um, again, as we were mentioning, the antenna, the place from where you're going to be putting your antenna, your area of coverage is going to be all around the antenna. So ideally, you will look for a place that is in the center of that community you want to be serving. In some cases, you can be putting your antenna in the edges, and it's possible that still you're going to have, um, you know, circle of uh, coverage that still is going to be um, serving the community that you want to, to, to serve, which is your target. Um, but again, um, depending on the terrain, that's what is going to actually be determined where you uh, actually are going to be putting your antenna. Um, but it's really important that you identify those neighborhoods that you want to be serving because sometimes people will find it really good um, places to be within their antenna, but those places are actually far from the places that you want to be serving. Um, so this is something very important and very key that before you actually start doing your search, that you look for those, um, those neighborhoods that are your priority to be serving again. Because uh, sometimes people will experience some frustration in trying to um, see, you know, like a, a prediction of what will be the coverage. And sometimes those neighborhoods that you want to be serving are no inside of that circle of coverage because your antenna is too far. So remember when you're looking for um, your tower site, just look for those areas that you want to be serving and try to find something around those areas first. And then, I guess, you know, if those places are not available, then you can start moving a little further away. But keep in mind that um, there's going to be a, a limitation of the in the distance uh, with 100 watts. Um, and again, um, I guess we can talk about the line of stuff that I was mentioning a little bit. So um, as I was mentioning for the STL, for the uh, system that you 
uh, cool install on top of your studio to be sending the signal to your transmitter site. This is actually similar uh, with the FM signal. So the way that it works is um, from the place that you're going to be having your antenna, those places, um, your listeners are going to be able to, to, to get the signal if, um, pretty much if they can, you know, see um, in a clear um, line of sight the place where the antenna is within a range of, um, of coverage again. Um, so this is how FM works, this line of sight. Um, so in some cases, um, the signal, if you have a building that is blocking your signal, what is going to be happening is the, the building is actually going to be absorbing part of the signal that you are sending. So your listeners probably are going to be experiencing some kind of interference or static because um, that signal they should be going to their to the receiver to the radio is being absorbed by this um, by this object. They can be buildings, they can be trees, they can be um, hills. Um, so it is very, very important that when you're choosing your tower stuff, you're keeping in mind that you want to have your antenna in a place that is tall enough in your town where, you know, you can imagine that people around is going to be able to, to receive the signal. Um, so again, look for tall buildings, uh, look for, um, for terrain, they will have uh, an ideal height. So, you know, like a, a terrain that, you know, can be like a hill, you know, sometimes when we're trying to look for a tall building, you know, sometimes they will find a tall building, but then that's in a lower um, part of town. So try to keep in mind that, that you want to go for higher places in your town and try to find also places that are not being blocked by other um, physical objects. And, um, okay, now talking again about the relationship between power and height. Um, so, um, one, of the, um, one of the fields you're going to have to fill out in your application is HAT, which is height above average terrain. And this is, um, this is a, a measure uh, that um, the FCC will ask you, and they have a, they have a, I believe there is a, they have a, 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 a link in your site where you can um, create um, or determine what is the hat um, from the transmitter site that you're choosing. And R3 also, it uh, will be able also to determine what is the hat of your transmitter site. Uh, so this is just, again, it's, a, it's an average um, 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 measure that um, is being taken uh, from the place and it has, you know, some, um, it's just taking the height of a, I believe it's a, like a, eight different places around your antenna and it's just the average of that height. Um, so in general, you don't want to go lower than 30 meters. Um, but again, if you go higher than 30 meters, um, you are going to have to reduce your power. And this is something that you're probably going to be able to see if you are using our free when you um, enter your location. Our free is going to be suggesting um, in a specific height where you want to put your antenna over the ground. And if you go higher from the, um, from the numbers that our free is suggesting, you're going to see a table uh, underneath that is also telling you that you're going to have to bring your power down. So this is um, this is something to keep in mind, and um, I guess uh, that we all can uh, show an example of a high calculation. All right. Yes. So um, we talk a little bit about height, and there were some questions of um, about uh, how how many watts equals how much um, uh, coverage. And um, it's important to, to understand that um, it's a combination of the height and your power that determine how much coverage you have, plus um, all of the uh, terrain issues and buildings and obstacles uh, in, in your coverage area. Um, so um, just 
put uh, the hat down on uh, the application for a low power FM station. And you'll see here um, we have a little example of how to calculate um, the height or your hat. Um, so, so here we are. If we have, if we're in a location that has a ground level um, at an altitude that's 30 meters above sea level, um, and at that particular point, uh, because of the terrain surrounding it, it has uh, an average um, height of negative three meters, uh, meaning it's three meters lower than the average height of the area. And your ideal height, your hat, ideal hat is 30, meter, 30 meters high. Um, the elevation you need on your antenna for that to happen is uh, 30 meters minus negative three meters, which is 33 meters, meaning in that location where you're um, three meters below the average height in your area, you would need a 33 meter antenna. Um, it need to be 33 meters high in order to get to your ideal height, which is 30 meters hat. Um, so if you had a building then that was 20 meters high and you're going to put an antenna on the roof, you would need to get uh, a, a small tower or mast which is like a, a pipe, um, that would be 13 meters high above the 20 meter building to get to your 33 meter height. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, now, this is not something you need to do longhand unless you really want to, um, because um, there are um, several programs available, including our free, that will do this for you. Um, in, in order to, um, you know, in, in the process of finding uh, frequency in a location. Um, all right, so we're going to move on a little bit to some of the some of the rules um, that you have um, to follow as an LCFM station. Um, the first one here is, is blanketing interference, um, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but basically, um, as an operator of an FM station. Um, you're required to uh, fix any problems that uh, listeners have listening to any radio station in the vicinity of your station, so your LPFM, which would mean that um, for, for an LPFM, it's a, uh, an area around it uh, of approximately 400 feet. Um, if there's some, someone there who's trying to tune into a station on the other side of town, happens to be in that 400 foot range of your station, you need to help them fix that problem. And usually that would be um, maybe helping them purchase a new advanced radio or just a new radio so that they would be able to pick it up. Um, that's not so important, but um, um, it is, it is um, one of the rules. Um, and I'm just going to go into um, some of these other rules. Um, briefly, and here we go. Okay, so rules of radiation exposure. Again, um, as uh, Will was mentioning, these are part of the rules, um, and you can find also the rules in the FCC website. Um, I'm going to try to find the link in a, in, a, in, a, in a minute, and I will try to put it in the chat so you can find um, if you wanted to read more carefully about these rules. But this is basically um, what is going to be telling you this rule. So you cannot be put in your antenna sometimes in some places, and um, the FCC is protecting, um, you know, sometimes uh, populated places um, and protected areas also. So if that's your case, if you're close to those places, you're probably going to have to present an, uh, a waiver. Um, so this is also going to be, you're going to find it in the rules and then you're going to find it when you're filling out uh, the technical box of Form 318. Um, you're going to see, I believe this, um, the aids are the translators and uh, other stations, and I believe that these are like Exhibit 9, 10, and 11, I think so. Um, so for this one uh, about radiation exposure, um, as you know, um, 
FM is um, it's because it's sending these signals. It's causing some kind of a radiation. So you cannot be putting your antenna close to places where people live, uh, where people are going to be, um, you know, exposed to this uh, radiation. Although it's a really small radiation, it still is radiation. So you're going to have to do something uh, to make sure that you're not, you know, creating um, of, uh, exposing people to this radiation. So generally, uh, you want to be 20 feet above any accessible area. So if you're going to be putting your antenna on top of a, of a building, um, you're probably going to have to be cleaning that, that, those 20 feet. Um, otherwise, you're going to have to present a neighbor um, explaining, you know, and, and, and for these purposes, you're going to have to be talking with an engineer. Um, so, yeah, thanks. And for me to just post a link where you can find also the old worksheets. Because, um, again, um, the SEC has and released the, the um, new uh, worksheets uh, to be attached with this uh, exhibit. Um, but you can find in, uh, in a Radio Spark the old uh, worksheet for environmental and um, um, you can find it in the in, in Radio Spark. So you can use those. Um, but again, I if you are if you think that you are gonna need one of these exhibits, you probably should be talking with an engineer. So this first again is you cannot be causing this uh, interference. Uh, I'm sorry, this uh, radiation. You cannot be exposing people. So you're gonna have to prove that you're not causing this. Um, then the next one is the radiation exposure, and this is um, the you cannot be putting also your antenna in places they are protected, and this includes uh, wilderness areas or wildlife that's being preserved. Uh, you cannot be treating uh, treating any uh, habitat or endangered species. Um, you cannot be in places that are designed as historic places. You cannot be in any places there are uh, Native American religious sites. You cannot be in footprints, and uh, you cannot be causing any impact in wetlands or waterways. So again, the new worksheets are not being released by the SEC yet. Um, but yesterday in the webinar of the SEC, they say that they're working on those worksheets and that they're going to be published pretty soon. So for now, you can go to the old ones and you can find those ones in uh, the radio sparkling that probably could just put in the chat. Um, so yeah, that's for that. And if you wanted to know a little bit more of what this, uh, and you can find it in the rules. Um, and then the rules about localism. Um, this is uh, related a little bit to um, when you the, the part the legal part, so the 75% of your board members need to be living within 10 miles of the transmitter site. Um, so you need to check with this uh, with your board members. So um, I would recommend if um, you can start contacting your board members now to be checking out all this. Be sure because sometimes I know that it's difficult to, you know, um, get all the information. And uh, we have a uh, checklist also in our website that you can find, where you can find more uh, um, um, information about what are the, the questions that you need to be asking to your board members. But one of the things, again, is the 75% uh, of the members need to be within 10 miles of the transmission site. Then the other rule is a nonprofit uh, uh, headquarters uh, need to be um, within 10 miles or 20 miles, depending on the market that you are. Um, so again, you can check this on our checklist that is in our in our website. You can go to prometheusradio.org um, and slash, and I think it's checklist. I do this checklist, and you can find more information about that there. Um, so the next one is uh, the local rules. So you need to, um, if you're thinking in, uh, in building a structure to place your antenna, you need to be paying attention to local rules. So zoning laws. So in, in cases where you want to be putting your um, 
antenna on top of a roof, um, you're just going to have to check um, what are the, the zoning laws in your community, because sometimes you cannot go um, with the high uh, structure because they can be to an endangered uh, population. And um, sometimes um, you need to check on those. And there's a, there's a, a document also that we have that can help you to find more information. Um, and I can also chat it in a second. Um, but those they are thinking and building a structure on top of roofs or they're thinking and uh, building a, a tower to be placed in their antenna, you need to be checking uh, with your county or with your city about zoning laws um, and finding for what structures you're going to need to get a permit. And in some cases, you are not going to be able to build um, your structure in those places. So it's very important that when you're choosing your transmitter site, that you're checking the sunny last before you, you submit your application. Because um, uh, if you choose a place and then you find out that you're not going to be able to build it there, then you're going to have to find a, a, a different place and then submit um, probably min minor changes. And that's just going to make the process to go a little bit more um, slower. So it is very important when you're looking for this place where you're going to be building your structure that you check with your county and your city about this zoning laws. And in some cases, you know, you can you can look for places that are not going to require a lot of uh, the creation of new structures. So as Will was mentioning, there is a variety of sites that you can um, think and put in an antenna. Sometimes thinking um, the uh, places there you know, are not in, in, in already being built in your in your town. So, you know, water towers are good places to be put in antennas. Sometimes places are, you know, um, like uh, the one that you're looking on the slide, this is a, a, a flag pole that, and it was enough, the height that was enough to be put in the antenna, and this was in one of the registrations that permit yourself to build. So sometimes you can be creative because um, in this case they just find this uh, flagpole and then the structure was already there and the only thing that they did is they just put an antenna there and uh, you know it, it was a way that if you sometimes if you if you put a flagpole you don't need to to go over this on in um, last so find out in your county in your city you know ways where you can actually be put in these structures. Um, Okay. And we'll, we'll talk now about the reasonable assurance, which is really important also. All right, so when finding a place for your antenna, um, if it's not property that you own, it's really important to get uh, a written notice of reasonable assurance. What that means is You'll get a letter, or you'll ask for a letter from your potential landlord saying that your organization gets a license. I will let you build a, uh, a antenna or put an antenna on my building or on my land, and we will work out the details of rent at that time. Um, now, this isn't required for the actual application, the actually filling it out, you don't have to put this on there. However, um, well, one, it's a really good idea. Um, and uh, because you can, if, if this falls through, um, if your location that you put down on your application falls through, um, you won't be able to build, build your station, right? Um, the second reason is, um, you could be challenged um, on your application. Uh, the public is asked to send in uh, a peti petitions to deny any application that the FCC receives. And um, this is, could be one reason that someone is asking to deny your application. That reason being this, this, uh, this group is not, is not, doesn't really have the ability to put um, their antenna in the place that they claim on their application. So 
So this is a really important um, thing to have. Um, this is a template that you can use. Um, you can kind of adjust it to suit your needs um, as needed, but um, this is kind of what I'm saying. Um, this is a template um, that you would have uh, a potential landlord send to you um, as proof that you could uh, rent that, that location and put uh, an antenna at that location. Um, one thing to, to uh, keep in mind is, is that um, you uh, finding, finding a, 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 you know, renting a place um, to put an antenna, you're going to have to explain what it is you want to put um, in uh, your potential landlord's property or on, on the top of their building. Um, and we have some, some resources for that, um, which you can find on our website. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, chat the link just right now um, for you. Um, yeah, so, so, that, so this is one um, important option. If you're going to put your antenna on an existing structure, someone else's uh, property, or um, a, an existing tower and rent space on a, a, a tower that has other radio stations or a cell tower, um, you're going to need this kind of, of document. Um, I'm going to I'm going to turn it over now back to Anna to talk about how to find um, existing towers um, that are already built that you have to rent um, space on. Um, so here we go. All right, so uh, I think we might have lost Anna, so I'm going to talk about uh, Oh, I'm antenna. sorry. I was, I was mute. I'm sorry. I was talking. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I'm sorry. So, again, um, so if you are looking for places that are being already registered, um, there are existing places. Um, as Will was mentioning, you can start looking for places where you can build your structures, but if this sounds too complicated, you can just look for um, the sources that are already being built. Um, so there are different ways how you can find these uh, sources that are already being built. And um, I'm just going to explain a little bit uh, how to use this option that is uh, an online software that you can access. You just have to type in your browser antennasearch.com. And what this company is going to be doing is going to be looking in a database um, of uh, structures that have been already registered um, with the FCC. So it is really, really easy to use it. You just have to enter your street address, your city, state, and zip code. And the software is going to run a search um, around uh, your community. and then you're going to see another screen when you click go when you're going to be looking at the towers that are being already built uh the the towers are being registered by the fcc and the places where there are antennas so um if we can go to the next slide you're going to see um there you go so again um, once when you enter your address, the subway is going to show you a similar screen to the one that you're looking right now on your screen. And these are just the results of the summary 
um, of what the subword is finding. Um, so once when you look at that, you can click uh, in the structures that have been already being built. You can click in the structures that are being registered that the application has been submitted, but it's possible that these structures probably haven't been yet. And then you can look also, you can click at the, at the third option, which is antenna. And then if you click there, you're going to be looking also at the, the, the places where there are antennas. So this can be um, small um, um, structures that can be just posed. So this is available and it's been, um, the information is being uh, given from, from the FCC database. And you're going to find this information here. So again, again some, some of these locations are going to be towers. Some of these are going to be smaller structures like poles. So once when you click in these uh, different sites, the software is going to be showing you specific information about the height of these places. And then you're going to be able to enter that information in your uh, search in R3 or in other software. And then you will be able to see um, if this is a place that it can be an option for you to put in your antenna. So, as Will was mentioning, um, um, again, if you're going to be building a structure and an assistant building, or you're renting uh, from a place, you're probably going to need to have a, a contract. So this is the, um, I guess, uh, having a, a place where you're going to be building your structure, uh, the advantage is that you're probably going to have just some kind of agreement with the owner and probably you're going to be renting that place from that owner and then you can put your antenna there. Um, but usually um, these uh, existing towers are expensive. So that's the downside of these places. There are these um, um, structures that have been already built. There's sometimes the cost of mm -hmm. renting spaces in the towers is, is high. So but it can be an option if it's too complicated for you to be um, building your own structure. So in some occasions, some um, radio stations will start renting a space in an in a existing, existing tower while well, they're running a plan uh, for fundraising. And eventually, once you have enough money to build your structure, you can move uh, to another location um, and then you can build your, your structure and improve your, your signal sometimes. Um, so that's something that you can do, um, but it's really important that when you are, um, if you are going to be uh, having a contract with one of these owners, it is really important that you really look um, about the time where you're going to be in this contract, because I know of an station in Tucson that they uh, rent a space in one of these towers in a, in a place that is really, really expensive, and the contract is for 20 years. And they already find a place where they can move, but because they signed this contract for 20 years, they're now 10 years in that contract, and they cannot get out of that contract, and they have to be keeping doing fundraising to get the money to be paying for that tower. And they already find another place, but it's really, really important for that reason that if you're going to be getting into one of these contracts, that you pay attention for the time that you're signing um, for this. And again, it can be an option, but you just have to be really, really careful with what you're signing into it. And there's other, other, other um, uh, ways where you can find uh, existing structures. Um, I'm not going to talk about that in this webinar, but um, we're going to be also putting a link where you can find more information. There is um, there is a, um, a file that you can use um, to. To, to, put it, uh, to run over Google Earth, and it works pretty well. It just needs a little bit, a couple more steps. And um, but the, the the file will be showing also uh, structures that have been also registered on the FCC. Um, but I will put a, a link where you can find more information about how to use that. But again, this uh, antenna search is really easy to use, and it can be an option for you to be looking for existing structures. And for questions uh, and what you should be asking to um, to owners of towers or places, uh, Will is going to be talking a little bit of what are like good ideas to be um, for questions to be asking to to owners. All right. So um, for 
we're renting a, a, a space on a building or existing structure that isn't an uh, existing tower, um, this is just a list of, of questions that you um, should um, ask the property owner. There's actually probably some other ones, um, but um, this is a good starting point. Um, I also just chatted a link to um, our transmission toolkit, which covers all of the information in this webinar today, plus um, additional information. Um, uh, it'll have it has some instructions about how to use AntennaSearch.com, also instructions on how to use the FCCinfo.com um, database of uh, existing towers that you can uh, look at in Google Earth. Um, so if you want to get more into this. Um, those are that that's a place to go. Um, also, uh, there's a um, a, a, a quick um, one one sheet um, information um, little package here that I'm gonna uh, here we go um, about antenna supports. Um, and this is um, a, a, a piece of, uh, you know, a little document that you can give a property owner to um, look at, um, and it'll explain and have some pictures about what an antenna and a little tower and uh, look like on the top of a building, um, and and how big the antenna is and all that kind of stuff. Um, yes. Um, all right. So um, we're running out of time. Um, but I, w I definitely want to um, get some questions in here. Um, so let's um, let's go to questions. Um, and yeah, so if you could tr chat your question, um, and we will uh, do our best to answer it. Hi folks, this is uh, Leah from Prometheus just chiming in for a minute to say thanks so much to our uh, fellow Prometheans here for a great presentation so far. Uh, and as Will said, feel free to chat any questions through the, um, through the chat box and, uh, and our two tech folks can try their best to answer those. And then we're just going to wait a minute and see um, where we go with the questions and then I believe we're going to move to uh, a demonstration about R3, which is uh, some software that helps you with um, with some of the stuff that uh, Will and Anna have been talking about so far. And I also just want to say thanks so much to uh, Pablito um, for also helping us out in the chat box so far uh, during this um, during this presentation. It's been very helpful. Thanks. Um, all oh, right. I so see. okay, oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just looking at the question here about how do we find out if we can use the previously existing tower. Um, so the way that you can find if you can use that one is first getting the location of that tower. Um, so get the coordinates of that place, and then you can run a search with R3 or with other software. You can use also the FCC um, channel search, and then that's going to create a report of the availability um, under that location. And that's the first step to find out if the location of that tower is actually going to um, be a good place for you to be putting your antenna. That will be the first step. Then the second step will be checking on the height of that existing tower and just making sure that the height also is going to be enough for the um, for the height that you need to be putting your antenna, or you're going to have to be reducing your power. So those two will be the first things to do. And then the third thing, it will be approaching the owner just to know if you can really afford uh, the, the cost of renting space there. Um, go ahead, Will. Um, I was going to answer that question as well. But um, uh, yeah, so there's a question about, um, well, first of all, the, this webinar will be, you can watch it again. Um, we'll, we'll have it um, in the archives. 
um, and we'll also make the slides available for you in an email. Um, and yeah, um, so there's a question about how far your uh, studio can be from your antenna, um, and I think the answer, answer to that is um, probably not not more than 10 miles or 20 miles, um, uh, depending on uh, you know it really depends on your uh, your board. Um, uh, we went over the requirements for how far um, your your uh, your organization's office or um, the members of the board need to be um, from the antenna. Um, it might not make much sense to put a studio outside of um, the transmission area anyway. Um, and since LCFMs are going to be very small um, in terms of their coverage range, um, I think having a studio 10 miles away would be a little bit far. Um, yeah. So there's another person that's asking what are the minimum amount of dollars to just get uh, qualified. So the application itself, it doesn't have any cost. Uh, but if you need to present a waiver, um, especially around the technical box, uh, you're probably going to have to hire an engineer. And you know, um, if you need to be performing a waiver, um, the price of uh, how much this will cost, it can go from high uh, $500 up to 2,000 or more. So depending on the engineer that you are working with. Um, but the application itself, it doesn't have any cost. And I guess it was like a, a, another question that's similar to the average cost to start your station. So we have also a um, couple documents in our website that you can review um, and we'll help to put together um, a list of equipment and um, here are the prices and, 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 and um, equipment. So you can go there and check about those prices and those uh, suggestions. But um, we estimate that uh, a budget for um, building a studio and for the equipment for transmission, it can be around $15,000. Um, but again, you know, if you are going to be getting uh, some donations of equipment, that cost can probably be reduced. All right, so um, uh, we didn't have time to go to the um, brief R free demonstration that I was going to do. Um, but um, there's some really good uh, how to videos about how to use R free, um, uh, which is the software that Paul Bain has been developing for Prometheus. Um, and uh, he just put together these, these videos. And I would highly recommend um, uh, looking into those. And there's, they, there's uh, you know, kind of a quick start guide, and then there's some uh, more advanced topics as you go through. Um, so uh, yeah, I would highly recommend looking into those, and you'll get some uh, more information about um, exactly how to, to go through the software and get the information you'll be needing um, to eventually put onto the application. Um, yep. Great. So I just want to uh, thank all of the tech folks who've been a part of this uh, this webinar again. This has been really helpful uh, to go through these really important parts of the um, of the technical aspects of getting a radio station, putting together a radio station, and certainly to find out where you can put a transmission site, where your transmission site will be. Uh, I just want to plug again, do a little plug again for Prometheus. Uh, we provide this webinar and Mint will be providing a series of webinars for free for all of our applicant groups and folks interested in community radio. So if you have the chance, um, of course, we welcome donations here. Uh, I just wanted to let folks know again to take a look at the webinars page, which is just prometheusradio.org slash webinars. Uh, and that tells you the upcoming webinars that are happening uh, throughout the next couple months leading up to the application window in October. And then also uh, for 
folks who uh, want to review the things that we've been talking about this evening or take a look at any of the trainings that we've had, uh, you can access the archives by going to prometheusradio.org slash archives. And for this particular webinar, we'll also include, since uh, often with the with the archives uh, webinars, we don't have the chat box. I'll make sure that all of the links that our presenters have been talking about are included. Uh, they'll be listed with the um, with the archive webinar, um, so that you'll be able to click through those while you're reviewing the webinar. Um, so I just want to say thanks again to everyone. Uh, it's been a great training, and uh, and I look forward to seeing all of the applications this fall. Um, and I'm really excited about uh, building stronger and um, broader low-power FM stations all across uh, the U.S. So thanks to everyone, and um, yeah, thanks again to our presenters.